Hello and um, welcome along. It's Andy, um, your host on this here podcast. Hello, everyone. Uh, well, here we are again in uh, episode eight. Um, but before we get going, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone that's tuning in, listening, uh, enjoying. Um, you know, people showing me on their mobile devices that they've listened to uh, every episode. DJ Harry, thank you. <laughs> it's much appreciated. Please keep supporting us. Um, I need to get the word out about all the fabulous people that work in, uh, in our business. So um, please share it. That's the key. Um, if you're enjoying it, then please share it afterwards and uh, let's get the word out there. Thank you so much. Um, back to episode eight and it's Mandy Dillon, um, well known to us all, I think, uh, subtitle Vidigo. Um, nice little chat with her about uh, her roots and her beginnings and um, how she got into the business uh, and what she's doing now. And um, well, please enjoy. Let's go. It's Mandy Dillon. So uh, here we are then, uh, episode eight. We are in the heart of, uh, we're in Staffordshire, aren't we? Yeah. And a beautiful little village as well. So, um, and the the feminine voice that you hear there is Mandy Dillon. Hi, Mandy. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Is it a good drive? Yeah, lovely. All the way over, straight one hour and a bit. So not too bad. Um, let's talk about the name, first of all. So Vidigo, come on, where does that come from? Well, so before I started my video business, yeah. I had a beauty business. A what? So, a beauty. Okay. So I was traveling the world, um, airbrushing, teaching people how to airbrush. So it was like airbrush tan, body art, hair art. Um, and that business was called Body Ego. Ah, okay. Yeah. So right. when I decided to go into the video side of it, I had a salon decided to sell it and then didn't know what to do so when I decided well I didn't decide it kind of just accidentally somebody said to me just film a wedding um so I was like okay I'll film a wedding um and that's how I got into it and then I was like oh I need a name and then I liked body ego so I just got rid of the body and put the vid okay so if somebody says to you uh, <clears throat> uh come and film my wedding where does that come from? Did they know you had to? Uh, oh, the guest, the guest star on this uh, pod today is Vinny. His name is Vinny. Uh, yes, we've got a guest guest appearance from Vinny in the background. So I'm not going to apologise. It's all part of the business. <laughs> so <laughs> right. So rewinding. Where are we? So if somebody says to you, uh, "Film my wedding." Why did they ask you? Okay, so it went something like this. So I sold the business. I I I'd just given birth to um, my child I found out I was pregnant again um, so when I had my first child it was okay to take this little baby into the salon and do what I needed to do but when he was nine months old I found myself pregnant again and I was like how on earth am I going to have two kids and travel and get into the salon so I needed to think of something I needed to do um, at, my, at that time my husband was in um, so it was also a case of I can't really keep two children away I need to kind of move in with him so this plan was get rid of the salon think of something else to do so my best friend she was a photographer and she says oh how cool would it be if we worked together could you can, can you film let's film and I was like I can't film she went oh, of course you can it'd be dead easy so I was spraying a client on that weekend who I knew was getting married so she'd come in in the week to say have the top of her tan and I just said to her who's filming your wedding and she says nobody and I says, oh, can I come and film me? And she just went, yeah. So I turned up. Well, on the Wednesday, I literally ordered a camera. I was going to say, you have to rush out and buy a load yeah. of equipment first. So I bought one camera, one tripod, one light, and that's all I had. And I literally turned up to a wedding and filmed it. And it was cassettes in those days. Mm. Of course, I come home and I was like, I don't even know how to edit or dig make them digital. Found out everything on YouTube, kind of downloaded it onto a, a laptop at the time, put it all together gave it to her and she burst out tears in tears because she was absolutely happy. And then I thought, you know what? I can do this. And there that's where go. it started. See, <clears throat> uh, it's funny, isn't it? How life takes a left-hand turn sometimes and you just finish up doing something that... But the, the great thing was I didn't kind of stop and think. I think if I stopped and thought about it, I probably would have convinced myself it was impossible to do. Mm. But because I thought, no, let's just go for it. Just that one camera, that one tripod on that one light was enough to make somebody happy. Do you, do you understand? Mm, and yeah, obviously absolutely. over time, 
I've got loads of cameras and gimbals and whatnot. But to start off with, it's just dead easy. You don't really need much. No, no, not to get going. You No, you absolutely don't. So from that, from that one uh, single wedding uh, and presenting the film and getting that sort of reaction, is that what then convinced you completely that this is what you were going to do for the rest of your days? Yeah, but then I thought instead of going out and filming, I thought how great would it be to sit at home and just edit? Mm. So I'd got married, my sister had got married, my brothers had got married. It had been like a year or so, hadn't received our film. So I was like, there's got to be a backlog of people not being able to edit. So I went through the Asian directory I rang as many businesses, I'm half the don't even know it was me now, but anyway, I rang loads of people and I was like, da, 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 I'm an editor. I knew nothing about editing, but I just says, I'm a wedding editor. If you've got a backlog, it'd be great to kind of get, you know, get in touch maybe. To, and nobody would give me any work. Everybody was just like, like, no, no, no. I don't know why. I think also hearing a female voice. Um, so in the end, I was like, you know what, sod this. If I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to film it and and kind of edit it myself. So mm. and that's where it came along. I was all right. I'm just going to go for it. So you couldn't get any work as a video edit. Was it because you didn't have a show reel to to put out there to people so you could sort of show your talent? Or I don't know. I don't think the Asian people in the industry gave me the time or day when I made that phone call. That's okay. the truth. Um, it was almost like yeah, whatever um didn't really they yeah I don't think they cared Mm. basically um so then that's obviously that's what I thought well I'm gonna have to do something here um and of course obviously when I was telling people that I'm gonna do this um that I just got a lot of people kind of going don't say silly Gil can't do that not film a wedding surely not kind of thing Mm. um so I got kind of that at the beginning again I didn't stop to think about that it was almost like no I, I can do this um, and I do remember a few weddings, and I won't mention the videographers' names, but I'm sure they know, um, where I turned up because I was only doing single-sided because I didn't yeah. have the equipment, obviously, to do double-sided. So I always found myself with a male-dominated team next to me. Um, oh, my God, I got hell. Hell, and I mean hell. Um, people standing in front of my cameras, making sure I wasn't getting a shot. Um, just just very, abuse. Very petty though isn't it but it, it, it is but now obviously what 16 years later you know I know lots of people have got a respect for me now but then they mostly just saw this person and then I'd get questions like so you, does your dad film I'd be like no I do so does your dad own the business no I do and it just they just mm-hmm. can't get their head around the fact that there was somebody who actually owned the business who actually went and filmed and actually edited so it was a bit of a it was a bit of a struggle to begin with. Do you actually find that when you visit a temple, you you're treated any differently to male videographers or no? You know what? I think I get more respect at a oh. temple. Yeah, like I have honestly, you know, the people at the temple will always come up to me and they will always say it is so nice to see a female videographer yeah like we've had speeches when they do the speeches at the end for the money <laughs> they will normally mention building the, fund building fund yeah they do normally mention the like the videographer mm. um and it's really sweet and it's like oh i've got a thank you today yeah yeah so i'm nice, surprised actually now you ask that question i am surprised that actually you would think maybe that you know that i'd they'd think oh what weird how weird or be a bit horrible towards me but actually it's the opposite in a temple that building fund thing, uh, because obviously you'd think after 13 years I would know the language, but um, maybe I should do your course and, <laughs> and learn, <laughs> learn some languages. Um, but there's one temple you go to and a guy stands up and does half an hour trying to flog his book because he had a heart attack. And it's just like you can feel the whole room wilting. And yeah. Just like going, the, 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 the great thing, I mean, it's, it is good. But I mean, the great thing is you hear the same story. So when you're at one particular temple, it's the same story. And that same story just happened last week. Okay, but then yeah, a yeah. month later, you're at the same temple and it's the same story. But that only happened last week. Yeah. And it's almost like the same story being used over and over again in the hopes that people will donate. And I get that they need donations and da 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 
But it's just like you sit there, you're like, I just need to clear this up and we just need to move on to the next bit. And it's just like, oh, here we go again. Just rewinding as well also back, you said that you'd got married and it had been a year and you still hadn't had your film. Yeah. That always puzzles me about Asian weddings because the delivery times are terrible. Yeah. Uh, If you take the white English wedding, if you want to call it that, um, these people want their videos back inside you know, a month, absolute tops. Mm. And I know, uh, obviously, uh, there's a lot less to cover. You know, there's generally, I don't know, a church ceremony or a civil ceremony and then a party and, mm. you know, uh, little bits in between, but nothing on the scale of a, of a of an Asian event. Um, but what what's your thoughts on that, on delivery times? So my delivery times aren't that long unless it's a hold up on the client's behalf. Um, but generally, it. I, I mean, I'm working on this year's April weddings already. Um, so I'm not one to hold back. Um, it needs to go out. It needs to go out. The quickest I've edited a film is filmed it on the weekend. It was delivered on the Wednesday kind of thing. I like, like to get onto it straight away, but yeah, I've got clients or while I've got other clients, you know, people that say to me, they haven't had their film for 18 months, two years, three years. I've had some phone calls with photographers I've worked with and they haven't had their photo albums yet. So it's, it is a nightmare, but I know I just don't understand I mean on my contract it states it's an eight months process okay. but that just gives me that flexibility so if we do get a massive busy season mm. uh, it gives me that leeway of just being able to kind of um, backlog them slightly but yeah no I, I don't know why it takes so long I was going to say I've shot for people whose footage is sitting on some hard drives here so uh Oh, right. So as a freelancer, you yeah, mean? Okay. Who still haven't had their footage. So obviously it hasn't been edited and hasn't sent out. Mm. So to me, it's always like, hey, I don't understand. Like, why wouldn't you just want that footage? Why wouldn't you just want to edit it? Why wouldn't you just want to send it out? So it's... And for you, is that because uh, you're still in the moment of that particular event? Because I think uh, you can, you know, if you if you leave stuff on a hard drive for several months before you go back to have a look at it, have you lost the enthusiasm from that particular event, do you think? Or? Maybe, but I also like to, when I back up my wedding, it goes straight onto my software. So I will sync it all up straight away and then I store it okay. so that when I do come back to doing it, it's already synced for me. Because yeah. I think that's one of the hard things that kind of forget little details of the day, what kind of happened and when it happened. I think if you did it straight away, it's almost like it's dead easy when you start to edit because it's all on your timeline, it's all synced ready and it's all ready to go. But that's a that's a, an intensive process in itself though, isn't it? Just, you know, if you're getting back at, let's say, three o'clock in the morning uh, and you're working the next day and you're working... Because I've got to say, just trying to nail you down to an, an actual date <laughs> when you're not doing anything has been uh, enormous fun. <laughs> And we've got you on a, a rare day off. So clearly you're working, 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 working. Mm-hmm. Um, so how do you manage your time like that? Um, okay, so I, if you'd asked me this question, let's say a few years ago, um, I don't know where I, how I was actually managing my time because I was constantly, constantly out. So it was wedding after wedding after wedding, two week, every weekend it was two weddings. It could be four weddings. It could be that I've sent a team out, you know, freelance a team out. Um, so the backlog was obviously a lot and mm. the editing was a lot. Um, I did have some editors on board then. Now, after COVID, I think COVID's taught me a lot. Um, I have kind of chilled out a little bit. Um, and I know the industry is kind of going through a funny pl- stage at the moment where we're all having like a weekend off or which is very rare. Um, and it's not like we're not constantly booked, but I quite like this now. I quite like the fact that if I'm working on a Saturday, I'm actually not going to bother taking on a wedding on the Sunday. Um, and I'm kind of just kind of playing with my time a little bit better, which obviously helps with the editing. Don't need the editors anymore. And I'm kind of just do my time when it, do you get what I mean? And I'm yeah, editing in the week what I've done on the weekend yeah, kind of makes I think sense. The thing with editing is, and I could, I could never imagine um, farming out the editing process to somebody else because I want to see what's, it's like the one I did uh, two days ago, edited and delivered the, ne- the next afternoon um, because I want to see what those shots are that are going out and I want to have the yeah. control over, mm. over what the customer sees. Mm. Um so if, if you, at that time when you were farming out to other editors, would you still have to 
bring it back into your timeline and sit there and go, no, not about this. And- so to begin with, yeah, but generally they never really did a complete film for me. So I kind of had an agreement with them where they would just put, let's say, the Anand Garage ceremony together for me. That's it. Or they'll just do the part one or the dancing or part two of the dancing and they just do the those bits where it's kind of like a multi-camera yep. rolling with it kind of thing but the little bits in between i.e the preps and all the little kind of creative things i never really allowed them to do because that was my little mm. thing um but like the dancing and stuff it's just easy as in fact my 13 year old daughter now edits for me oh wow in her spare time and she's always like mommy can I have a new edit uh, so i do pay her a little bit and she edits and again she just edits the the not the boring bits i don't want to call them boring bits but the easy bits not the creative bits if you get what i'm saying mm-hmm. so it kind of works and mm. it's it, it's easy and she'll sit there on the laptop and put so a- you're you're um you're essentially uh, grooming the next generation of dylan's to uh, yeah. step forward yeah arjun's been coming out with me on some like some, on some thingies, on some gigs, he's been filming with me. I've been okay. letting him loose with the camera. And um, she's been editing. And what are the results like, do you think? Yeah, really good. I mean, being, they're younger, aren't they? Their yeah. creative heads work completely different to mine. I don't tend to want to sit down and teach them, teach them. I kind of go, this is how it works. Go and get what you can. Um, and they just do it. And I, I look back at their footage and I think, oh my God, that's really good. Well, it's the kind of TikTok generation, I guess, isn't it? You know, they... The, they do have an eye. Some people do have an eye. Yeah, so it's nice. I mean, I don't know if I'd want them to go in, into it full time, but it's nice that they can earn money. When they want something, you know, they can be more money to money. Can I do an edit? It's like, yeah, go on then. And it's nice for them. That's interesting. Why wouldn't you want them to go into it full time? I don't know. I mean, I'd like them. I don't know. I mean, if they did, they did. It wouldn't be. I always say to them, you've got to do whatever makes you happy because this makes me happy. Um, I can't imagine not doing this. Um, so I always say, do what makes you happy. But yeah, again, if they did want to go into this, it'd be fine. But if they didn't, it would also be fine. It's not like mm. I want to push it on them. Okay. And I don't expect them to edit. I don't expect them to come out with me. It's it's what they want to do. If, if they want to come out, they'll say, mom, can I come out with you to the next one? I'll be like, yeah. Um, so it's kind of like that. But okay. it'd be interesting if they did. Um, just stepping back slightly to um, early days. Hmm. And you were talking about um, incorrigible other videographers or, or photographers that couldn't get wrap their head around the idea that a lady might be filming. Mm-hmm. Um, how did you overcome that? I don't think I did. I think it was just years of just they kept seeing me come back um, over and over again. You know, I weren't going anywhere. Uh, and then I made the best mates. All my, all my closest friends are in the wedding industry. Uh, or male. Um, so I think generally over time, they just thought, okay, she's not going anywhere um, and built a little bit of respect. I guess it's sort of when the, what was it called? When you had the um, the, the gimbal and you had that um, weight. Oh, the um, Steadicam. Steadicams. I yeah. guess it's the time when the Steadicams and Big stuff Big shout came out. out to Pete James for, the, for being the original yeah, bless <laughs> Steadicam. So I guess when stuff like that came out, equipment came out and I was purchasing stuff like that and then going out. I think people thought, okay, yeah, maybe she's serious and maybe she's not going anywhere. Maybe, you know, it is a full-time career for her. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I kind of just went in, into it like that. And the single-sided, um, that always puzzled me why clients would ever go for two separate teams of photographers, two separate separate uh, teams of videographers who are all fighting against each other to get that one shot. And um, it always struck me that... 25 years down the line, family sits down with their two finished films um, and one of them's going to be shit compared to the other one. <laughs> yeah. know, it, it, yeah, it's yeah, inevitable yeah. one's yeah. going to be better than the other. Yeah. So why would people um, waste their uh, money in that way? So um, is that a cultural thing, do you think? I don't know, but it works out so much more expensive if you've got two complete different teams. So I, I just can't get my head around why anybody would do it. Obviously, when I first started, I had no choice but to just do the single sides. And I guess that really annoyed other videographers because they probably thought, well, we could have had this as a double side booking. Mm. Why have they booked her? And one of the questions used to be, is she your friend? Is the bride your friend? Because possibly I couldn't have the idea of filming somebody's wedding. Completely. Yeah, no. um, so I guess when you're starting off, if you're going to offer something 
a really low package because you need to showcase a wedding or you need to do something. I guess that's when the single side comes in. But now I'd never dream of taking a single side book in. Um, I mean, we had the odd one, but I would never, ever, ever, ever consider kind of taking on single side bookings because it's just a complete and utter hassle. Yeah, they're, they're a nightmare from start to finish for, yeah. for um, all the creatives, I think. And, um, you know, I, I, I started the same way with Gill Media. We were doing single side uh, weddings um, now and then. And it's, and it's just, there's so many people on the dance floor trying to get the shot of the bride and groom. Or, you know, it, it's, it's always seemed counterintuitive to me to actually even consider buying that as a product as, I mean, as a bride and groom when I have asked people when they have asked for a quote for a single side and I've said well why are you considering that they always say well so and so so and so film so and so's wedding and they lost all the footage and we want to just make sure that if that's the case we've got two teams so if one person was to lose the footage or something happened we have got another team kind of thing right. So I kind of hear that sometimes, but again, it's multi-camera. So if one camera was to go down, chances are you're still going to make an amazing film, you know, because that's the whole idea. Now we're not just filming with little cameras or two cameras. We there's normally about. Oh, I've six. seen you. I've seen you running around with just, just like if you had six arms. I would have six. Cam- I would, honestly, <laughs> have six yeah, cameras. I would have six cameras out. So uh, the acquisition of equipment then, as we've moved through the years, where where are you at now compared to day one? So now I've probably got about five Canons, two Sony, three, four Sonys, something like that. Gimbals, drone. Sliders. Yes. You, you haven't got me. a crane though. I haven't got a crane, <laughs> but I've got Vince. Ah, well, there you I go. Mean, I mean, that's, that's the best, isn't it? <laughs> But yeah, he was my first ever crane. Whenever when I first decided I was gonna, you know, add in a crane. Yeah, Vince was the first person I hired in. Bless him. Hmm. Um, but yeah, so he was always my go-to man. Bless him, <laughs> top man. Hey Vince, how you doing, mate? Come on the pod. <laughs> we want you on the pod. <laughs> okay, so I'm just gonna break in here and interrupt proceedings just to um, put the begging bowl out again. Uh, please share. If you're listening to this and you're enjoying it, please share it out. Um, and let's spread the word about, you know, the fantastic people that uh, work in our business. Um, that's the biggest way you could support this podcast uh, is to um, spread the word. So thank you very much. Um, let's get back to Mandy Dillon. Um so uh, another notable thing I know um, about Mandy Vidigo Dillon is like 13 billion YouTube views. So how do you um, how do you get there? There's, there's one particular film I think you've got, and it's tell me the numbers. Oh, I don't know. Was it about six six it's million ludicrous. views or something silly ludicrous. like that? Yeah, I don't know actually, Andy. I don't, I don't know. I just decided one day that I was going to get up and every single week I was going to put something on YouTube. Hmm. Uh, and then that's what I did. I thought, I don't care if I get no views. I'm just going to do constantly for one whole year and see where I am one year later. And one year later, I was like at 70, 80K subscribers and 26 million views, I think, something like that. So you do know the numbers, really? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> somewhere like that. But, um, but yeah, I kind of, you know what, to be honest, I've kind of not done it for a while. I, I need think, to get back in. I think what you said there was you didn't care initially <clears throat> whether you got, you know, loads of views and followers or whatever. And I think that's a great place to start from. Uh, mentally, if you if you've got no expectation um, of where it's going to go, then anything is a bonus, isn't it? Yeah, and I kind of looked at YouTube at that time, and there were lots of people doing um, ved- weddings or vlogs at weddings and other bits and bobs. But what what they weren't doing was a vlog regarding the service users. So there was nothing showing who the cake cake mm. ca- you know who created that cake, who that DJ was what that venue was about, where the bride and groom got their outfits from. So there wasn't that kind of thing. So that's the angle I kind of decided to do it from. So it was almost like interviewing people on the day, you know, about the venue, about the cake, about little bits and bobs. And it was just nice then when I was getting a book in to say to people, well, if you want to have a look at these past weddings I've done, it gives you an idea where people are getting the outfits from, who did their cake. And it kind of, so it was almost like, 
it was great, but at the same time I was using it at my advantage because people could log in and go, oh, that's a great idea for a cake or that's a great, oh my God, that outfit's gorgeous and this is where they bought it from. And do you know what I mean? And, well, this DJ is great or da, da, da. That's exactly where the idea for this podcast came from, really, because I, I know there are such a lot of richly talented, almost artisan craft people uh, doing what we do, <clears throat> not just videographers, as you say, cake makers, DJs, venues. There's so many people that um, just don't get a shout out ever. No, no. Caterers, nobody does no. really at the end of the day, do they? This is why when I saw your first podcast, I was like, oh my God, this is exciting, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm yet to make any money at it though. You so will, we'll, keep going, keep so going, keep we'll, going. We'll, we'll see. Right. So this is a question that... Um, sort of comes up all the time but when did you think you'd made it I don't think I still have do you ever think that somebody's gonna sit there and go oh I think I've made it like no that's a question and a half isn't it well it is but but also um the way I sort of think about it is when I first went to the Grosvenor Mm. and you know sort of set up and you think wow big time Hmm, maybe when I went to India to film. Okay. So... Tell me about this. So, um, I was going on a holiday, decided to put a little thing on Facebook just to say, we'll be in India between this date and this date. Any couples out there want to do a couple shoot? I thought, make some money while I'm out there. Makes sense. Um, and this yeah. is a typically Indian thing, isn't it? I'm going somewhere. I need to make some money. Make while the I'm money, there. yeah. I need to pay for this flight somehow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so that kind of put it, put that out there and... A bride contacted me saying, I actually fly now that week and I'm getting married. Could you film my wedding? Wow. And I was like, yep, let's book it in and literally booked in. So like I said earlier, my best friend was a photographer. She's not anymore. Um, and she was flying out with me. So we both went there, filmed and photographed the whole wedding for her, paid for all our accommodation and our whole holiday. They're fantastic, <laughs> aren't they? Destination <laughs> weddings, please bring them back because, <laughs> oh my, oh my, they're good things to do. Yeah, especially when you can make a holiday around it. I just don't like the ones where you kind of turn up, you film, you fly back. It just takes the fun out of it. Well, uh, I think the destination weddings that I did with Salshan, for instance, he would always tag on a couple of days before and a couple of days after. 100%. uh, Just to sort of settle yourself in, get acclimatised with the um, place that you're at. Uh, maybe get a bit of B-roll as well. Yeah. Um, and I think th- those extra couple of days uh, really make the difference mm-hmm. to those destination shoots because you can go out and you can get the lie of the land and you can see what's what. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Um, who do you admire in the business currently, video-wise? Who do you look up to and think, hmm, very good? I don't, you know... I ought to ask the, I ought to ask the controversial question is, who do you think is really crap but I don't (laughs) um to be honest it's probably people that are not in the industry anymore okay um they kind of helped me through my journey um let's have a name Pete James yeah absolutely top notch um couldn't ask for a nicer guy really helped me even when I hired him just a shooter Mm. he just went out the way did have, you know, like, oh, even to the sense I remember once we had a bit of an issue at a wedding. Um, we had a particular team going to one wedding. I was at another wedding and Pete was going to be with me at my, the one wedding. And I remember a little disaster happening the night before. Um, we were all in a restaurant eating because we knew they had this wedding in the morning. And Pete James was like, sod that. I'm going to go there now. He's going to sleep in the car. Okay. He's going to do the preps in the morning. And then he'll meet me later at my wedding. And he was just... Like those people that uh, are prepared to do that are a rare breed, aren't they? Hundred percent. Like honestly, Pete, Ben, Vince. Yeah. You know they're just stop it with the Vince. I know, but they were always. <laughs> I felt like they were always there for me. It yeah. was almost like when I first started, it was almost like I, I knew they had my back. Yeah. And I think when you have somebody at the time, because you know Pete was big, when you had somebody like Pete shooting your weddings with you people were taking me a little bit more serious if do you get what I mean on the backside of all of them guys it and was also like, perhaps you can relax just a little bit knowing that you're in a safe pair of hands yeah 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 so I mean I, I'm 
I'm quite relaxed with my shooters. Everybody, whoever shoots for me now, they'll tell you the same. I don't expect much. I have my safe cameras. I know the shots that I need. And I always give them, you know, do what you want. Just get me some creative footage and do what you want. I never watch over their shoulders, ask them to do certain clips. And I just find that's just a, a nice way of getting the best out of the shooter as opposed to, did you do this? Did you do that? Have you done this? Have you done that? Do, 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 yeah, do yeah, you know what I mean? And yeah. most of my shooters will always say it's so relaxing to film when they're part of my team. Hmm. So are you where you want to be in the industry or is the is the Dylan dynasty going to, you know, what what's your sort of ambitions? Um, I'm in a happy place. Good. I'm, yeah, I'm in a good happy place. I'm happy with kind of what's coming in. I'm happy with the amount of work that's coming in. I don't think I want to go pre-COVID where we were kind of absolutely chocker. I think I just, I just want to balance it a little bit more. I think uh, COVID taught us all that actually. Um, because it, aside from anything else, it gave us time with their families. Well, yeah. When you when you when you went from lots of income to zero income to minus income because you were refunding people, but then you realise you you're still surviving. It was almost like, well, what? Why are we working so hard? Why is it that I'm not seeing the kids on the weekend? You know, why is it that I'm not spending time with the family? Mm. You know, um, I had loads of personal problems as well through COVID, mm. um, so. Oh, it was just, COVID was just a complete nightmare for me. Coming out of COVID was difficult. Um, going into my first wedding was difficult. Um, so yeah, it's just, I, I think what people don't realise is they see this happy person online and they always think, oh my God, her life must be amazing. Yes, it's amazing. I'm not going to say it's not, but you, nobody really knows the truth. Hmm. Do you get what I mean? So like, for example, last year, August, I lost my father last year, August, um, and I and I buried him on the Wednesday, and I was filming on the Thursday. It's just That's and you got it? it's hard, and you've got a smile on your face, and you've got to keep going. Nobody knows. You make sure that you don't put it on social media because you don't want the family to know you've had a, a bereavement in the family because you don't want everybody coming up to you asking you if you're okay because you're only going to burst out in tears. So it's just like oh, it's just constantly trying to kind of keep going, but keep that smiling, keep kind of, do you get what I mean? It's difficult in our industry. We can't just go, oh, well, we're not turning up tomorrow. No, absolutely. It, it, come come hella high water, the, the, you have to maintain that sort of energy, I think, yeah. um, for the client just to provide the best that we can for yeah. people. And it's funny how I can be really, t I did a, a, a Hindu wedding just last week, huge great break in the middle for me because I'm just doing the jib. Um, and I was so tired, mm. so tired. And I thought, and when it came to the evening, that energy just kicked in. And it's just like, okay, we're back. Mm. Um, and it was a bit like that with COVID as well, I think. The, the first wedding back, I was kind of, do I remember how to do this? Yeah, it's scary. it was so scary. Yeah. So scary going into your weddings again. But yeah, it's hard. It's hard what we do, but I don't think people realise it. Um, and the social media thing is a double-edged sword as well, like mm. you say, because uh, you want to project a sort of happy happy image and then when your own personal issues mm. uh, can't intrude um, on on top of that. So when you did the first uh, couple of weddings, did you at that point set a goal in your mind for the future or did you just run with it? I just ran with it because I had two kids, um, very small. Okay. Um, so I don't think I had time to think about goals or how many weddings I wanted to do or set myself a little target. It was almost like I kind of worked around the kids hmm. and I just kind of went. I don't think I really ever thought I would be or do as many weddings I was doing. I don't I don't think I ever did. I thought maybe it would be just, you know, every so often I'll do a wedding. I didn't expect myself to be doing a wedding every single weekend. It just kind of snowballed I, I didn't have control over it it was like bookings okay. were coming and I didn't know how to say no yeah. <laughs> I've learned how to say no <laughs> okay um, but I didn't know how to say no and it was almost like and it, it was just silly you'd be in Scotland on a, on a on a Saturday you'd be down in London on a Sunday you'd be like why did I even book that in but you don't think it's like you know you've got a date free it's free you're booking somebody in bang it's in that's you know? the mentality I think a lot of people have and and I think it's pre-covid uh, though not yeah. now I think it's a lot of people's undoing yeah. Um, because they get into a situation where 
um, so many weddings left to edit, and yeah. yet they've got to be in Stranraer or something yeah. to do another one the next day. So now it's always like, if I know I've got a date free, I I have to have a look. Actually, where am I the day before? Mm. You know, like, what am I doing the day or two days before? Am I going to be, can I manage that? Is it going to be too much hassle? Whereas before, it, it was never even, even a thought. It was like, yep, my date's free. Yeah, let's get that booked in. We'll mm. sort it somehow. And I suppose, is that the big lesson of COVID? A hundred percent. I I don't know when to slow down, Andy. Honestly, I just, <laughs> really? honestly, even now I'm learning two different languages. It's just, I cannot stop. And it's just... Hang on, what? what, what, what? Oh, I don't ask. I'm just decided to learn a few languages just on apps. Okay. Just because... I just don't, I just need... In case need... you get a destination wedding in Greece, you, you need to know <laughs> I just, lingo. I just have to always be doing something. Okay. So I've gone from crocheting to learning languages. <laughs> I can't help it. Um, but crocheting? Yeah, I, I know, I know, don't. I but make actually, blankets and scarves for people. But actually, maybe that's a great unwind thing because that's a very peaceful kind of uh, activity. Yeah, so I can't sit and watch a movie without doing something. So either it used to be, I've got the movie on and I've got a laptop in front of me and I've got my headphones in, but I've got one ear out, one ear in, and I'm editing. Mm. And I'm kind of trying to multitask by watching what's on the telly and I'm editing at the same time, which obviously annoyed everybody in the family. But then I thought, well, I need to do something. So it started off with colouring and that didn't work for a little while. But then then it was a case of, oh, you know, I'll try a bit of knitting and some crocheting. And I absolutely love the crochet side of it right. so that's what I got into so now when I'm watching telly out comes the crochet needles <laughs> I'll leave that image with everybody <laughs> <laughs> when I turn up in a um, in, uh, to a job in a, a crocheted v-neck jumper uh, with Fidigo written It'll, yeah <laughs> know where it comes from yeah um you talked earlier about uh, the reaction of that uh, particular bride from your very first one mm. <clears throat> That's so satisfying, isn't it? I think. Oh. Talk, talk to me about how those reactions. Oh yeah. Affect you. Uh, yeah, hundred percent. Because you've got to remember, I knew nothing. Like, not even how to take the cassette version and stick it onto, you know, onto a laptop. I've been. I think I was destined to do it because the laptop I had bought was a Sony laptop and it already had like a cheap version of Premiere Pro on there, like not not the best, just like an edition that was just free on there, mm. um, which I didn't know. I didn't even know what the program on there was for. But when I started kind of researching, I was like, I've seen that program. And then I realized I actually already had it on my laptop. Um, so it was kind of... It was it's learning everything from scratch and not knowing what I was doing and then putting it all together and then sending it to her. In fact, she came here to watch it, come in here, put it on and she watched it and she cried. I mean, it's just like, oh my God, I can, I, I can actually do this. It's not as hard as everybody's making out. It's dead, <laughs> e it's dead easy. Well, it was with one camera. Yeah. Now with multi-cameras, obviously, it's getting a little bit more difficult. But it was, I was just, I couldn't believe that I did it. Yeah. I think uh, I've talked about this before as well, but the fact that um, we document people's lives in a way which um, you were talking about earlier, losing your dad. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and I filmed stuff uh, for our family uh, before I got into the business, really. Um, and there's so many people on those films that have passed since. And you see those people in such a happy place partying mm -hmm. or, you know, just enjoying themselves. And we, we document those moments and we save them for posterity. And um, I think it's a wonderful thing that we oh, do. Oh, 100%. Absolutely. It is an amazing little thing that we do. Um, that was a bit down, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> nice questions, please. <laughs> okay. <laughs> what do you think your competitors think of you? Oh, <gasps> here she comes again. Um, I don't know. Uh, Do you think you're well regarded? Yeah, I think so. Now, maybe. I think I am. I think they'll always say, if you were to ask anybody, they'd probably go, oh, she's always smiling. She's always in a good mood. She's always smiling. Um, but yeah, I think so. I think that's what they'd probably say. That's good. What's the most challenging wedding you've ever filmed? Ooh, challenging wedding. I think the most challenging one I did was a number of years ago. So we were filming the pre-night of the wedding and um, 
so the auntie of the bride, fit as a fiddle, absolutely amazing. She came onto the dance floor and she just literally collapsed. She collapsed and she dropped dead. Oh, man. Yeah, so it was, I mean, the cameras were still rolling. We didn't even think. The bride gave her mouth to mouth um, and she sadly passed away. So the next morning was obviously the wedding. So I think that was my most difficult one. They obviously couldn't cancel the wedding at sh such short notice. Families weren't told of the death. They were told that she was in hospital and that she wasn't very well. Um, so yeah, I think that was my most difficult wedding um, because everybody was happy because they didn't really know what happened. Sure. But obviously we knew and the bride knew, the groom knew and the immediate family knew. Mm. It was just a difficult wedding. Wow. Yeah, but so difficult. I mean, I always think about it now and it's just yeah. hor horrendous what happened. Absolutely horrendous. And what about the happiest? Happiest? My COVID weddings. Go on then. Yeah, so my little small COVID weddings. I found that they were the most intimate, most happiest. I think it were genuinely couples who were genuinely in love, who genuinely wanted to get married. And it wasn't the whole facade of having to have this, having to have this, having to invite so-and-so, having to better the last wedding they did. Do you understand? Yeah, 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 so, absolutely. Was, so I think they were my happiest and my most amazing weddings. And actually, there's another one that comes to mind. It was a couple who uh, were very religious, mm. didn't want it filmed, um, but the family insisted I be there. Um, so I kind of turned up at this wedding and the groom weren't very happy to see me. Um, but he kind of relaxed around me and there weren't the whole facade of like the bride and groom entrance. The bride and groom sat with the guests and when it came to them having their wedding ceremony, they just stood up, sat together and they literally went around. Nobody held them. Nobody did anything. We had, we jotted cameras everywhere and we kind of just sat still, not trying to intrude. You know, the footage was absolutely amazing. Really? Yeah. So peaceful, so clean, so amazing and I always refer back to that word and I just think to myself you don't really need the whole sometimes the whole kind of everything and zooming and you know like honestly such a gorgeous wedding and they obviously did ring me and thank me because they they were amazed on how it was captured on the day yeah but that, I think probably you just surprised the living daylights out of them by supplying something they didn't know that they wanted yeah basically so, um, um it was really really lovely and I kind of picked the the good tracks like there was no Hindi Bollywood or any Bhangra on there it was like literally the most soothing kind of Gidden tracks on there and they were just like can't believe you did this hmm. I was like nor can I <laughs> um just talking there, do you um, do you limit yourself to Asian weddings or do you do the white weddings as well? Yeah, no, I do a variety of weddings, Andy. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think I just get booked mainly for Asian weddings or most of the time. Okay. Um, I like Asian weddings. I like the, the busyness. Hmm. I find that English weddings or other cultural weddings can just be boring kind of thing because you, the day's kind of dragged and it's, it's just at a slow pace. And I get that some people like that, but I quite like the whole next go, get, duh, duh, duh. And it kind of, the day goes fast and it's just. White, white people <laughs> dancing at, at weddings is just. I don't know how you get the um, coverage for the edit. You don't. It's very difficult, isn't it? Whereas uh, Indian weddings, they don't stop. Literally, uh, if, if I'm doing a white wedding, I'll sort of say 20 minutes after the uh, first dance and I'm done. because well, They don't want to dance if the camera's no. on. They want you out, no. don't they? Yeah, which is, a, again, a strange cultural thing where um, brown people will invite you into their little circle on the dance floor and, yeah. Say, yeah, yeah, and play to the camera. And, yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know, with, with my crane overhead, people will pull it down, you know, sort of, beckoned me down to get right in there and yeah. and, um, and I love those moments I think they really make for for special special food and I think the other thing about advantage of being a female when I'm on, on the dance floor with a gimbal I do find that people will mess around in front of me a little bit more yeah, yeah. because when I'm on the dance floor and I know the lyrics of the songs and I'm kind of bopping around with them uh, they kind of sense that from me and they kind of play with my camera quite, quite a lot so yeah. I get I do get a lot of good gimbal footage yeah so, um, hey, look, we've done uh, really good. We're up to about uh, 
after I edit out all the coughs and everything, we're down to probably 40 minutes, which is fantastic. So time for the final question, which is the usual one. Um, given the business we're in, what if I could give you uh, the tools, capability, knowledge, whatever, to do any job within the wedding business, what would you do? What would I do? I would not organise weddings, but I'd like to stand and coordinate them. So you know when we're at weddings and we're filming and nobody knows what's going on and we're almost like, what's going on? What's going on? Why don't you do this? Why don't you do this next? And it almost sounds that the time can drag because we're losing minutes, which is losing hours. I'd like to be somebody who would be able to say to the family, this is next, this is next. Okay. Move on to that. Or while they're doing one certain thing, you're ready and running off and preparing the next thing. Kind of, do you get what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, almost absolutely. like yeah. coordinating it, but not organizing it. Not a wedding organizer. Yeah. Like just on the day kind of going, do this, do this, do this, do yeah. that. Um, I did one at a uh, motorcycle museum uh, just a couple of months ago and that couple had a coordinator and it, and it does make things just work properly and on time. Yeah. And the point that Jas Johal made uh, on his pod was those times when we're losing half an hour here and half an hour there and half an hour, that's costing that's costing the couple money. Yeah. Uh, because caterers are delayed and so they've pr- maybe got to pay their staff extra. Waiting, Car's got to stay stuff. a little yeah. bit longer. Everything's got to be staying yeah. You've got to pay your videograph a little bit more because they're now going to have to yeah. stay. Or the venue has, let's say, an 11 p.m. Uh, curfew and the couple get 20 minutes of dancing because they've run so late and so the party then becomes a disappointment almost. It's like when you get to the, the, the temple and you stand there, you go, what are we waiting for? Everybody goes, I don't know. They're like, mm. let's get started then. And then like somebody's waiting for the priest to come out because, and it's just like, well, that could have been organised if somebody just knew, mm. you know, they would have got that priest out ready, mic'd, sorted. You know, like it just saves minutes. Even if it saves minutes, minutes, will it's hours, isn't it, by the end of the day? Every single time. Yeah. yeah. Um, right, well, uh, it's been an absolute pleasure uh, thank you for inviting me into your home. Thank you for the uh, cup of excellent builder's tea, uh, <laughs> and um, we'll um, we'll see you uh, we'll see you all soon. Thank no, you. No, 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 not going yet. I thought while you're here, I might take the opportunity to maybe ask you some questions. No, nobody wants to hear that. They do, Andy. I think there's loads of questions. Well, um, I'll tell you what. We'll have a break. Have another cup of excellent builder's tea, and the next episode will be Mandy Dillon interviewing. Jibs TV. Yay! <laughs> no, no, nobody will tune in for it. I swear. <laughs> so there we go. Uh, that was episode eight, Mandy Dillon. Um, really interesting chat, I thought. And a huge thanks to Mandy for inviting me over and finding time for me and making me great cups of tea. Always a bonus. Um, next episode, as you've uh, already heard, will be me. And, um, well, I'm not sure how that's going to go. Let's see. Um, Thanks very much for listening. Uh, Stay with us and keep spreading the word. Bless you. Thanks very much. Bye, y'all.